Qui-Gon Jinn was one of the most able swordsmen in the Jedi Order. The Jedi Master he had trained under had considered him one of the best the Master had taught in his more than 400 years in the Order. Qui-Gon had fought in conflicts all across the galaxy in the span of his life and against odds so great that many others would not have stood a chance. He had survived battles that had tested his skill and resolve in every conceivable way. But on this day, he had met his match. The Sith Lord he battled with Obi-Wan was more than his equal in weapons training, and he had the advantage of being younger and stronger. Qui-Gon was nearing 60, his youth was behind him, and his strength was beginning to diminish. His edge now, to the extent that he had one, came from his long experience and intuitive grasp of how an adversary might employ a lightsaber against him. Obi-Wan brought youth and stamina to the combat, but he had fought in only a few contests and was not battle-hardened. Together, they were able to hold their own against the Sith Lord, but their efforts at attack, at assuming the offensive against this dangerous adversary, were woefully inadequate. Darth Maul was a warrior in his prime, never to be any better, his powers at their apex. In addition, he was driven by his messianic hatred for and disdain of the Jedi Knights, the enemies of the Sith for millennia. He had worked and trained all his life for this moment, for a chance to meet a Jedi Knight in combat. It was an added bonus that he was able to engage too. He had no fear for himself, no doubt that he would win. He was focused in a way that Qui-Gon recognized at once. A Jedi's focus. Mindful of the present, locked in on what was needed in the here and now. Qui-Gon saw it in his mad eyes and in the set of his red and black tattooed features. The Sith Lord was a living example of what the Jedi Master was always telling Obi-Wan about how best to hear the will of the Force. The three combatants fought their way across the hangar floor, lightsabers flashing, bringing to bear every skill they had acquired over the years. The Jedi Knights tried continually to press the attack, and indeed, the Sith Lord was moving away from the Naboo and the Starfighters and back toward the hangar's far wall. But Qui-Gon recognized that while it might seem as if the Jedi were driving him before them, it was the Sith Lord who was controlling the struggle. Wheeling and spinning, leaping and somersaulting with astonishing ease, their enemy was taking them with him, drawing them onto a place of his own choosing. His agility and dexterity allowed him to keep them both at bay, constantly attacking while at the same time effectively blunting their counterattacks, relentlessly searching for an opening in their defense. Qui-Gon pressed hard in the beginning, sensing how dangerous this man was, wanting to put an end to the combat quickly. Long hair flying out behind him, he attacked with ferocity and determination. Obi-Wan came with him, following his lead. They had fought together before, and they knew each other's moves. Qui-Gon had trained Obi-Wan, and while the younger Jedi was not yet his equal, he believed that one day Obi-Wan would be better than he had ever been. So they challenged the Sith Lord quickly, and just as quickly discovered that their best efforts were not good enough to achieve an early resolution. They settled into a pattern then, working as a team against their enemy, waiting for an opening. But the Sith Lord was too smart to give them one, and so the battle had gone on. They fought their way out of the main hangar through an entry that led into a power station. Catwalks and overhangs crisscrossed a pit in which a tandem of generators that served the starship complex was housed. The room was cavernous and filled with the noise of heavy machinery. Ambient light filtered away in clouds of steam and layers of shadows. The Jedi and the Sith Lord battled onto one of the catwalks suspended above the generators, and the metal frame rang with the thudding of their boots and the clash of their lightsabers. Alone in the power station, Hidden from the rest of Thede and its occupants, they intensify their struggle. The Sith Lord leapt from the bridge on which they fought to the one above, strange face shining with the heat of the battle and his own particular joy. The Jedi followed, one coming up in front of him, 
one behind, so that they had him pinned between them. Down the length of the catwalk they fought, lightsabers flashing, sparks flying from the metal railing of the walk as they smashed against it. Then Darth Maul caught Obi-Wan off balance, and with a powerful kick, knocked the Jedi completely over the railing. Taking advantage of the Sith Lord's assault on Obi-Wan, Qui-Gon forced Darth Maul over the railing as well. Down the Sith Lord tumbled, landing hard on a catwalk several levels below Obi-Wan. The force of the fall, or perhaps the unexpectedness of it, left him visibly stunned, and Qui-Gon leapt down after him, sensing a chance to put an end to things. But the Sith Lord struggled back to his feet quickly and raced away, taking the battle in a new direction. By the time Obi-Wan had recovered, Qui-Gon was in pursuit of Darth Maul, following him down the catwalk toward a small door at the far end of the power station. The Jedi Master went swiftly, legs and arms pumping, lightsaber flashing. He was worn and battered by now, close to exhaustion, but the Sith Lord was on the defensive at last, and he did not want to give him a chance to regroup. Qui-Gon! Obi-Wan called after him, trying to catch up, but the Jedi Master did not slow. One after the other, the three antagonists passed through the small door into a corridor beyond. They were moving quickly in their frenzied chase and were into the corridor before they realized what it was. Lasers ricocheted off buffer struts, pulsing in long bursts of crisscrossing brilliance that segmented the corridor at five points. The lasers had just begun to kick in when the Sith Lord and the Jedi Knights rushed through the entry. Darth Maul, in the lead, got farthest down the corridor and found himself trapped between walls four and five. Qui-Gon, in close pursuit, was caught only one wall away. Obi-Wan, who was farthest away in the chase, did not get past even the first wall. Shocked into immobility by the buzz and flash of the lasers, the antagonists froze where they were, casting about for an escape, finding none. Qui-Gon took a quick measure of their location. They were in the service corridor for the melting pit the disposal unit of the power station's residue. The service corridor was armed with lasers against unauthorized intrusion. There would be a shutoff switch somewhere at both ends of the passage, but it was too late to look for it now. The Jedi Knights stared down the laser-riddled corridor at the Sith Lord, who gave them a wicked grin. Don't worry, they could read it in his dark countenance. You won't have long to wait for me. Qui-Gon exchanged a meaningful glance with Obi-Wan, then dropped into a guarded crouch to meditate and wait. Padme Niburi, Queen of the Naboo, along with her handmaidens and Captain Panaka and his soldiers, followed the passageways that led out of the main hangar through the city and back to the palace. It was a running battle fought building by building. Corridor by corridor, against the battle droids who had been left behind to garrison Theed. They encountered the droids both singly and in entire squads, and there was nothing for it each time but to fight their way clear without becoming entangled in a full-fledged engagement. As a consequence, they avoided a direct route in favor of one less likely to necessitate contact with the droids. At first, they had no choice but to make straight for the palace, fleeing the battle in the main hangar, hoping that speed and surprise would carry them through. When that failed, Panaka began to take a more cautious approach. They used underground tunnels, hidden passageways, and connecting skywalks that avoided the patrols scouring the streets and plazas. When they were discovered, they fought their way clear as quickly as possible and went to ground, all the while continuing steadily on. In the end, they reached the palace much more quickly than Padme had dared to hope, entering from a skywalk bridging to a watchtower, then making their way along the palace halls toward the throne room. They were in the midst of this endeavor when an entire patrol of battle droids rounded a corner of the passage ahead of them and opened fire. Padme and her followers pressed back into the alcoves and doorways of the hall, firing their own weapons in response, searching for a way out. More battle droids were repairing, 
and alarms were sounding throughout the palace. Captain! Padme shouted at Panaka above the din of weapons fire. We don't have time for this! Panaka's sweat-streaked face glanced about hurriedly. Let's try outside, he shouted back. Turning his blaster on a tall window, he blew out the frame and transparisteel. While her handmaidens and the bulk of the Naboo soldiers provided covering fire, the Queen and Panaka, together with half a dozen guards, broke from cover and climbed swiftly out the shattered window. But now Padme and her defenders found themselves trapped on a broad ledge, six stories above a thundering waterfall and catchment that fed into a series of connecting ponds dotting the palace grounds. Pressed against the stone wall, the Queen cast about furiously for an escape route. Panaka shouted at his men to use their ascension guns, motioning toward a ledge four stories farther up on the building. The Naboo pulled the grapple line units from their belts, fitted them to the barrels of their blasters, pointed them skyward, and fired. Slender cables uncoiled like striking snakes, the steel clawed ends embedding themselves in the stone. Swiftly, Padme and the other Naboo activated the ascension mechanism and were towed up the wall. From behind, in the hallway were her handmaidens and the rest of the Naboo soldiers still held the battle droids at bay. The firing grew more intense. Padme ignored the sounds, forcing herself to continue ahead. When they were on the ledge above, they cast away the cables and Panaka used his blaster on a window to open a way back into the building. Transparisteel and permacrete shards lay everywhere as they climbed through once more, finding themselves in yet another hallway. They were close to the throne room now. It lay only another story up and several corridors back. Padme felt a fierce exultation. She would have the Nemoidian Viceroy as her prisoner yet. But the thought was no sooner completed than a pair of destroyer droids wheeled about around one end of the hallway, swiftly transforming into battle mode. Mere seconds later, a second pair appeared at the other end, weapons held at the ready. In a hollow, mechanical monotone, the foremost of the droids ordered them to throw down their weapons. Padme hesitated. There was no possibility for an escape unless they went back out the window, and if they did that, they would be trapped on the ledge and rendered helpless. They could try to fight their way free, but while they stood a reasonable chance against battle droids, they were seriously overmatched by their more powerful cousins. In the wake of this chilling assessment, an inspired thought occurred to her. A solution that might give them the victory they sought in spite of their situation. She straightened, held out her arms in surrender, and tossed aside her blaster. Throw down your weapons, she ordered Captain Panaka and his soldiers. They win this round. Panaka blanched. But, your majesty, we can't- Captain, Padme interrupted, her eyes locking with his. I said to throw down your weapons. Padme gave her a look that suggested he clearly thought she had lost her mind. Then he dropped his blaster to the floor and motioned for his men to do the same. The destroyer droids skittered forward to take them prisoner, but before they reached the Naboo, Padme was able to complete a quick transmission on her comlink. Have faith, Captain, she urged a bewildered Panaka, her voice cool and collected as she slipped the comlink out of sight again. Things were not going well for the Gungan army. Like the Naboo, the Gungans were no match for the destroyer droids. Slowly but surely, they were being pushed back, unable to stand against the relentless Trade Federation attack. Here and there, along their beleaguered lines, cracks were beginning to appear in their defense. Jar Jar Binks was at the heart of one of those points. For a time, his had been one of the strongest positions. His soldiers rallied by what they mistakenly believed to be his unrivaled bravery, turning a rout in a counterattack. But the counterattack had extended itself too far, and with the appearance of the destroyer droids, it collapsed completely. Now Jar Jar and his comrades were in flight, falling back to where the rest of the army crouched in the shadow of the falling generator shield, desperately trying to find a way to regroup. Jar Jar, his Kadu long since lost, was running for his life. Desperate to increase the distance between himself 
and the pursuing destroyer droids. He caught up with a fleeing wagon filled with dozens of the energy balls used by the Gungan catapults. Grabbing hold of the wagon gate, he tried to haul himself into the bed, the wagon jouncing and creaking over the uneven ground. But in his effort to save himself, he unwittingly released the latch on the gate, causing it to flop open. Energy balls released out the back in a wild tumble, bouncing and rolling backward in a swarm. Jar Jar danced out of the way, scrambling to avoid being struck. He was successful in this, but the less nimble destroyer droids on his heels were not. Energy balls mashed into them, exploding on contact, and droid after droid went up in a rain of fire and shattered metal. This is good, Jar Jar howled in glee, watching the Federation droids wheeling this way and that in an effort to escape the carpet of energy balls rolling into them. Elsewhere, however, the battle was taking a turn for the worse. Destroyer droids had broken through the Gungan lines fronting the shield generators and were firing their weapons into the machines over and over. The Famba on which the generators rode shuddered and dropped to their knees, the generators smoking and sparking. Abruptly, the force field began to waver and fade. OOM-9, watching it all through electro binoculars, was quick to report back to the Nemoidian command. Federation tanks were ordered forward at once, their guns firing anew. When General Seal saw the shield generators lose power, he realized the battle was lost. The Gungans had done all they could for the Queen of Naboo. Turning to his staff, he signaled for a retreat. The battle horn sounded the call, wailing out across the grasslands, and the entire Gungan army began to fall back. Jar Jar had gained control of a new mount and was riding madly for the safety of the swamp. Fleeing in the midst of pursuing droids and tanks, he had his Kaudu blown out from under him and was thrown sideways onto the back of a nearby tank's gun turret. Hanging on for dear life, he rode the enemy vehicle across the plains as the battle raged on all about him. The droids inside the tank quickly became aware of his presence, and the driver tried to throw him off by swiveling the turret gun from side to side. But Jar Jar had a death grip on the barrel, hugging it tightly to him and refused to be dislodged. Help me! Help me! He screamed out. Captain Tarples, astride a Kadu, worked his way alongside the tank, yelling at Jar Jar to jump. Laser fire ricocheted off the tank, barely missing Jar Jar as he struggled to overcome his fear and break free of his precarious perch. Hatches were beginning to open and droid heads to appear. His eyes widened as he saw weapons being lifted and brought to bear. He jumped then, flinging himself clear of the tank, landing awkwardly behind the Gungan who had stayed to save him. The Kadu, burdened by two riders, lurched wildly, then righted itself and swerved quickly away. Explosions mushroomed all around them, sending gouts of dirt skyward, and Jar Jar Binks, arms wrapped around the other rider, eyes closed in terror against the chaos taking place all around him, was pretty sure that this was the end. Anakin Skywalker, meanwhile, was caught up in the midst of a dogfight between Naboo and Federation starfighters. Still struggling to get off autopilot, he had avoided engagement with the enemy mostly because his craft was flying in an erratic, evasive manner that took it out of combat range every time it got too close for comfort. Fighters were exploding all around him, some so close he could see the pieces as they flew past his canopy. Woo boy, this is tense! He breathed as he tried switch after switch on the control panel, the fighter dipping and yawning in response to his unwelcome interference with its operation. But he was learning the control panel too, his trial and error exploration yielding knowledge of what various switches, buttons, and levers did. The downside to all this was that the firing triggers to the laser guns had locked, and try as he might, he could not find a way to break them free. He glanced up from his search at a loud beep from R2-D2 to find a pair of Federation fighters approaching him head on. R2! R2! Get us off! The astromech droid overrode the rest of what he was going to say with a series of frantic whistles. I've got control! Anakin exclaimed in shock. He seized the steering, flipping on the power feeds, and jammed the thruster bars left. To his surprise and everlasting gratitude, the fighter banked sharply in response 
and they shot past the fighters and rode into a new swarm of combatants. Yes! I've got control! Anakin was ecstatic. You did it, R2! The astromech droid beeped at him through the intercom, a short, abrupt exchange. Anakin's eyebrows shot up as he read the display. Go back to Naboo? Forget it. Qui-Gon told me to stay in this cockpit, and that's what I'm gonna do. Now hang on! His enthusiasm overrode his good sentence, and he whipped his fighter toward the center of the battle. All of his flying instincts kicked in, and he was back in the pod races on Tatooine, a part of his ship locked in on the intoxicating challenge of winning. Forgotten was his promise to look after Qui-Gon and Padme. They were too far away for him to think about them now. All that mattered was that he had found his way into space, taking command of a starfighter and being given a chance to live his dream. An enemy fighter drifted into his sights ahead. Sit tight, R2, he warned. I'm gonna blast this guy. He brought his ship into firing position behind the Trade Federation craft, remembering belatedly that the triggers to his laser guns were locked. Frantically, he searched for the release. Which one, R2? He shouted into his helmet. How do I fire this thing? R2-D2 beeped wildly. Which one? This one? He punched the button the astromech droid had indicated, but instead of releasing the fire mechanism, it accelerated the fighter right past the enemy ship. Whoa! Anakin gasped in dismay. Now the Trade Federation fighter was on his tail, maneuvering into firing position behind him. Anakin yanked hard on the steering, shooting past the massive Federation battleship, screaming out into the void in a series of evasive actions. That wasn't the release! The boy screamed into his intercom. That was the overdrive! R2-D2 whistled a sheepish reply. The enemy fighter was behind them, again and closing. Anakin banked his ship far to the right and brought it back toward the blockade and the swarming fighters. Wrenching the stabilizers in opposite directions, he began to spin his fighter like a top. R2-D2 shrieked in despair. I know we're in trouble, Anakin shrieked back. Just hang on! The way out of this mess is the way we got into it! He shrieked toward the control station, taking the enemy fighters with him. Laser blasts ripped past him, barely missing. He waited a second longer, until he was so close to the battleship that the emblem of the Trade Federation painted on the bridge work loomed like a wall, then engaged the reverse thrusters and banked right again. His fighter nearly stalled, dropping away like a stone for a heart-wrenching moment before stabilizing. The enemy fighter, on the other hand, had no time to respond to the maneuver and rocketed past him into the side of the battleship, exploding in a shower of fire and metal parts. Re-engaging the forward thrusters, Anakin wheeled the ship about, searching for new enemies. Through his canopy, he could see a handful of Naboo starfighters engaged in attacking the Trade Federation flagship. Rick Ollier's voice came over the intercom. Bravo 3, go for the central bridge! Copy, Bravo Leader, came the response. A squad of four fighters plummeted toward the battleship, lasers firing, but the big ship's deflector shields turned the attack aside effortlessly. Two of the fighters were hit by cannon fire and exploded into ash. The remaining two broke off the attack. Their shields are too strong! One of the surviving pilots shouted angrily. We'll never get through! Anakin, in the meantime, was under attack once more. Another Federation fighter had found him and was giving chase. The boy jammed the thruster bars forward and sped down the hull of the flagship, twisting and turning through its channels and around its tangle of protrusions. Laser fire ricocheting past in a constant scream. I know this isn't pod racing, Anakin snapped at R2 as the astromech droid beat reprovingly at him. But in his heart, it felt as if it were. A fierce glee rushed through him as he whipped the Naboo fighter along the length of the battleship. The speed and quickness of the battle fed into him in a rush of adrenaline. He would not have been anywhere else for the world. But this time, his luck ran out. As he neared the ship's tail, a laser blast struck his fighter a solid blow, knocking it into a stomach-lurching spin. R2-D2 screamed anew, and Anakin fought desperately to regain control. Great gobs of bantha poodoo! The boy hissed, 
fighting to stabilize his stricken craft. He was hurtling directly toward the hull, and he pulled back on the thruster bars, cutting power and drifting into a long slide. He regained control too late to turn back, and pointed the ship toward a giant opening at the battleship's center. Cannon fire whipped all about him as the droids controlling the flagship's guns tried to bring him down, but he was past them in a microsecond, rocketing into the battleship's cavernous main hangar. Reverse thrusters on full power, dodging transports, tanks, fighters, and stacks of supplies, he struggled to keep his fighter airborne as he looked for a place to land. R2-D2 beeped wildly. I'm trying to stop, Anakin shouted in reply. Whoa, whoa, I'm trying! The Naboo fighter struck the decking and bounced, reverse thrusters powering up in an effort to break the craft. A bulkhead loomed ahead, blocking the way. Anakin brought the fighter down on the decking with a bone-jarring thud and held it there, skidding down the rampway in a screech of metal. The fighter slowed down and did a half turn and came to an unsteady halt. The power drive stalled and then failed completely. R2-D2 whistled in relief. All right, all right, Anakin gasped, nodding to himself. We're down. Let's get the engine started again and get out of here. He ducked down to adjust the feeders to the fuel lines, checking the control panel indicators worriedly. Lights are all red, R2. Everything's overheated. He was working on the coolants when R2-D2 beeped suddenly in warning. The boy popped his head over the edge of the cockpit and looked out into the hangar. Uh-oh, he muttered softly. Dozens of battle droids were approaching across the hangar floor, weapons raised menacingly. Their only escape route was blocked.